the presentation that we're going to study now as well as our last one tomorrow afternoon, we are going to take a look at the number of the beast, 666. And in your syllabus, this is lesson number eight. So you need to go to the index of your syllabus and look for lesson number eight. And that is the lesson that we are going to study. However, before we do, we are beginning a new session. And so we want to ask God to bless us in a special way as we study this very important subject. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask for the Lord's guidance. Father in heaven, we're about to study a very important lesson. And I just ask that you will be with us through the ministration of your spirit and your angels. I ask, Lord, that you will not only bless those who are gathered here, but you will also bless all of those who will watch this on television and on DVD. I ask, Lord, that you will open hearts and minds. I know that this is a strong message, but I ask that through your Holy Spirit, you will bring it directly to the mind and to the heart and give conviction to each soul. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of prayer and for hearing us, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. For as long as I can remember, Seventh-day Adventist evangelists have applied the number 666 to one of the Latin titles of a succession of popes, namely the title Vicarious Philly Day. They have claimed that this title, which means Vicar of the Son of God, is one of the official titles that have been traditionally used by the popes. And some of our evangelists have even affirmed that this title was once on the pope's tiara or triple crown or on the pope's mitre. The question is, have our evangelists been correct in this assessment? Is this run really one of the official titles that is borne by a succession of popes in the Roman Catholic Church? Was this title really on the papal tiara or on the papal mitre? Recently, several of our ablest scholars in the church have answered no to all of these questions. A new view has appeared on the scene with defenders of high caliber, such as Dr. William G. Johnson, Dr. Beatrice Neal, Dr. Samuel Bacchiocchi, Dr. John Pauline, Dr. John Stefan Ranko Stefanovich, and Dr. Angel Manuel Rodriguez. These theologians have challenged the traditional view of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and have proposed a new view which is radically different than the traditional view. The traditional view is very specific. It applies the name and the number of the beast directly to a succession of Roman Catholic popes. The new idea has removed this specific meaning from the Roman Catholic papacy and has applied it in general terms to an end time alienation of the human race from God. Dr. Beatrice Neal, who taught at Union College in Nebraska for several years, articulated the new view. And so I'm going to read what she has to say about the number 666. It's somewhat difficult to understand what she is actually getting at, but I'm going to read it as she uh, states it herself. Six is legitimate when it leads to seven. It represents man on the first evening of his existence entering into the celebration of God's creative power. The glory of the creature is right if it leads to the glory of God. 666, however, represents the refusal of man to proceed to seven, to give glory to God as creator and redeemer. It represents man's fixation with himself, man seeking glory in himself and his own creations. It speaks of the fullness of creation and all the creative powers without God. 
And then she continues saying, the practice of the absence of God. It demonstrates that unregenerate man is persistently evil. Now that definition, I would like to find it somewhere in the Bible. But I don't really find it in the Bible. The idea that six is incomplete because it doesn't lead to seven, and therefore six represents humanity alienated from God, I fail to see the reasoning in the Holy Scriptures. And we're going to see the reason why. This rather philosophical, conjectural, if not speculative definition of the number 666 has been picked up and simplified by Dr. Angel Manuel Rodriguez, who was for quite a while the head of the Biblical Research Institute of the General Conference. And now I quote from Dr. Rodriguez, who, by the way, is a friend. He's a good friend. I disagree with him on this one. And the only reason I'm quoting him is because he's gone public. So when scholars put their views out there, uh, they can be taken to task, right? So this is the definition that he gives. The Greek phrase translated, it is a man's number, could be also rendered, it is the number of humanity. In that case, it is not referring to a particular person, but to a characteristic of humanity separated from God. Since God created humans during the sixth day, it could stand as a symbol of humanity, but a humanity yet, yet not at rest with God, and without the joy of a harmonious relationship with God during the seventh day. The number reveals the rebellious nature of the enemies of God and His remnant. That seems to be the best available interpretation. This change has upset some in the church who feel that the traditional view is more than adequate to explain the mystery of the number 666. Many feel that the new view uh, is indefinite and fuzzy, whereas the old view is definite and clear. Others have gone so far as to believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been infiltrated by Jesuits who have a hidden agenda of destroying our distinctive prophetic roots with a view to ultimately destroy the Seventh-day Adventist Church itself. This latter fear has been fed recently by Adventist college teachers who have stated that we should build bridges of understanding with Rome rather than criticizing her. The conspiracy flames have been further fanned by a medal that was given to the Pope by the religious liberty of the General Conference. And also when the flag of the Holy See was paraded on the stage at the 2005 General Conference session in St. Louis, during the March of Nations on the last Saturday night. So we need to take a look at this subject and determine if the traditional view makes more sense and is more biblical than this new view which appears to be indefinite and appears to be fuzzy. However, before I do that, I would like us to go to the last pages in this chapter and you're going to find an interesting interview. This is an interview that Sean Hannity had with a Roman Catholic priest by the name of Edward L. Beck. And I want you to see that this Roman Catholic priest has the same view that is being proposed by these scholars presently in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So when you have this idea that perhaps Roman Catholic views are infiltrating the church, this is fanned by interviews such as this. You'll notice on the second page there are some statements that are in bold. Those are the ones that I'm going to take a look at. This is Beck, the Roman Catholic priest. In the scripture, God is related to the perfect number seven. In the book of Revelation, it says that the beast is man. The beast is humankind. We are 666, and there's the potential for evil in all of us. We will always be less than seven. 
Do you see the similarity between that view and the new view that is being proposed in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And then Beck makes a very interesting observation and admission in the other part that is in bold, a little bit further down on this page. Uh, Beck is answering Hannity's questions. Some have even linked the number to the holiest of Catholic institutions. And he's asking him if this is true. And Beck answers, actually, it was Pope John Paul II. If you look at his Latin name, Ioannis Paulus Secundo, and you take the Roman numerals from that name, guess what they add up to? 666. If you take the Latin name that refers to all popes, vicarious fili Dei, this is a Roman Catholic priest that is saying the title of all of the Roman Catholic popes is what? Vicarious fili Dei, which means vicar of the Son of God. If you take the Roman numerals out of these, guess what? They add up, to, guess what they add up to? 666. Very, very interesting statement. Uh, in this interview uh, with Sean Hannity on Fox News. So let's go on a tour and try to determine if the traditional view is correct. We're going to go now to the subtitle that says a blasphemous name. We're going to look as we start at four very important facts that will help us determine what is the correct view. In this article or in this talk I would like to take a closer look at the number 666 as it relates to the name of the beast. As we begin, there are several biblical facts that help us understand this enigmatic number and the system to which it applies. Here is the first fact that I want to bring to the class now. A very important fact that sometimes is overlooked is the fact that the name, according to Revelation 13, verse 1, is a blasphemous name. Notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1 speaking about the beast. We've already talked about the beast. What does the beast represent? The Roman Catholic system, without a shadow of a doubt. We've studied it extensively during this week. Notice, then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a what? A blasphemous name. So first of all, we are supposed to look for a blasphemous name, a name that uh, is characterized by blasphemy. Now we need to, of course, understand what blasphemy is according to the biblical definition. Because you can't know what a blasphemous name is unless you know what blasphemy is. So let's go to our next section in the syllabus to determine what is the biblical definition of blasphemy because the name is a blasphemous name. The scriptures clearly define blasphemy as man's attempt to occupy the place of God and as such to exercise the power and prerogatives of God. When Jesus affirmed, I and my Father are one, in John chapter 10 and verse 30, the Jews, of course, went ballistic. They picked up stones to execute the death penalty against Jesus, required by the law, according to Levit Leviticus 24 and verse 16. When Jesus asked them for what evil work they were going to stone him, they responded, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. So in other words, blasphemy means when a man claims to be what? God. Claims to be God or be the representative of God. Do you know that Jesus also was accused of blasphemy for claiming to be the Son of God? So any, and was Jesus the representative of God? Absolutely. So anyone who claims to be God or the representative of God is committing the sin of what? Of blasphemy. The ter terminology of this accusation is very significant. The accusation launched by the Jewish leaders. Jesus was reprimanded for blasphemy because he, in their view, being a man, made himself God. 
In fact, Jesus not only claimed to be God, he also claimed to work what? The works of God. In the thinking of the Jewish leaders, Jesus was guilty of blasphemy when he claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the Son of God, the representative of God on earth, in other words. All the Jews claimed to be sons of God in the general sense of the word. But it is clear that Jesus did not claim to be a son of God. Jesus was claiming to be a spokesman for God on earth. His vicar, if you please. This is the reason why Jesus could say, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus undoubtedly claimed to be vicarious day, the vicar of God, and rightfully so. Blasphemy is also defined as when a mere man claims to have the power to what? To forgive sins. This means that any man who claims to have the right to exercise the prerogatives of God in the forgiveness of sins is guilty of blasphemy. When Jesus told the paralytic at Capernaum, your sins are forgiven, the religious leaders murmured, saying, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but whom? But God alone. Now, could Jesus forgive sins? Yes, because he was God. But any man who claims to have the power to forgive sins, who is not God, but claims to be God, is committing the sin of what? The sin of blasphemy. The religious leaders were actually thinking, if this man claims to have the right to forgive sins, then he must claim to be God because only God can forgive sins. Are you following me so far? Now, let's talk about the Antichrist who sits in the temple of God. We're still pursuing the meaning of blasphemy. We've already noticed that blasphemy is, blasphemy is when an individual who is a human being claims to be God's representative on earth. It also means when a simple man says that he has power to forgive sins. Let's go now to this phrase, the temple of God. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 and 4 has similar terminology to what we just noticed. Here we are told that the man of sin sits in the temple of God. What is the temple of God? The temple of God is the church. Every time that the Apostle Paul uses the expression temple of God, the naos of God, it means the church, spiritually speaking. It's not talking about the literal temple of God in Jerusalem. So, once again, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4 uses similar terminology here. The man of sin sits in the temple of God that is in the church proclaiming himself to be what? He proclaims himself to be God, but he is really what? He is really man, according to this. Once again, we notice that the power of the man of sin is human. And yet, the man of sin claims to be what? Claims to occupy the place of God in the temple of God. Later on in the passage, we are told that this power also claims to perform the works of God. You can see that in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9. And the three words that are used to describe the works of this Antichrist are the very words that are used to describe the marvelous works that Jesus performed while he was on earth. In other words, the man of sin is going to counterfeit the wonderful works that Jesus performed while he was on the earth. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4 actually paraphrases the language from Daniel 11, verse 36, which we already studied. It describes the period of the 1260 years, where we are told that the king of the north shall do according to his will. Who is the king of the north according to what we studied? The same as the beast, the same as the clay, the same as the abomination of desolation, the same as the harlot, the same as the little horn, the same as the beast. It, many different ways of describing the same power. So uh, Daniel 11.36 tells us that the king of the north shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself. Is this quoted in 2 Thessalonians 2? Absolutely. Shall mag magnify himself above every god and shall speak what? 
marvelous things against the God of gods. What are the marvelous things that the king of the north speaks? Blasphemies, according to Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and Revelation chapter 13. It will be noticed that the exaltation of the king of the north to the level of God is linked with the great words that he speaks against the God of gods. The use of the word man in these verses does not require that we find one particular person as the fulfillment. Adventists have understood that the word man in this passage, man of sin, and by the way, the Protestant reformers understood the same way, all of the Protestant reformers believed that the man of sin represents the papacy. Every single one of them. I can give you quotations. They said the man of sin that sits in the temple, that sits in the church, saying that he is God, is a symbol of a succession of popes within the Roman Catholic papacy. So the use of the word man in these verses does not require that we find one particular person as the fulfillment. Adventists have understood the word man in this passage to refer not to an individual, but rather to a succession of persons, namely the popes of Rome. In this context, it is worthy to notice that the little horn of Daniel 7 that symbolizes the same power as the beast of Revelation 13 and the man of sin of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 has a mouth that speaks what? Pompous words against the Most High. Daniel 7 verse 25. These great words are identified as blasphemies in Revelation chapter 13 verse 5 where we are told that the beast was given a mouth that speaks great things and blasphemies. This little horn or beast not only claims to be God, but also claims to have the power to exercise the prerogatives of God, even to the point of changing God's prophetic times and His law. He shall think to change the law. Thus, in a very specific sense, the little horn or the beast claims the right to occupy the place of God and to exercise the power and the prerogatives of God. In what sense does this horn or beast in Daniel chapter 8 speak blasphemies against God? Daniel 8 provides us the indisputable answer. In Daniel 8, in distinction to Daniel chapter 7, see Daniel 7 says he speaks blasphemies against God. But in Daniel 8, we have a definition of what those blasphemies are. In Daniel 8, we are not told that the little horn speaks blasphemies against the Most High. Rather, we are told that the little horn attempted to supplant or take the place of the Prince of the Host by taking away the daily ministration from him. Thus, the little horn's blasphemy consists in the act of trying to supplant or take the place of the prince of the host and to carry on his work of salvation. Are you following me or not? This is Bible. This is not human speculation. This is not philosophizing and conjecturing. This is biblical. In the light of this overwhelming biblical evidence, it would seem that the blasphemous name of the beast must be linked with his attempt to supplant or occupy the place of God and to exercise the power and prerogatives of God. There can be no doubt that the power represented by the little horn, by the beast, and by the man of sin is the Roman Catholic papacy. We've studied this extensively during this week. The little horn and the beast does not appear in a vacuum. There is a clear sequence of powers which precede the horn's arrival on the scene and the beast's arrival on the scene. Let's do a little review of the prophetic chain. First of all, we have what? Babylon. Then we have Medo-Persia. Then we have Greece. Then we have what empire? The Roman Empire. Then what happens to the Roman Empire? It is divided. And then... The divisions of the Roman Empire, the ten horns, among them rises this little horn that speaks blasphemies against the Most High and claims that he can even change the law of God. Is this referring to humanity in general? 
absolutely not. It applies to the beast or the little horn that rises from the ruins of the Roman Empire. Now let's take a look at the testimony of church historians on this particular characteristic of the papacy, speaking blasphemies against the Most High. I'm going to read now from the encyclopedia, Roman Catholic encyclopedia called Prompta Bibliotheca. By the way, somebody sent me a complete, a, a complete collection of this encyclopedia, which I have in my office. It's very hard to find because it's an old encyclopedia. But in that encyclopedia, in volume 2, uh, in the article Papa, which means Pope, uh, this is how the encyclopedia says about the Pope. The Pope can modify divine law since his power is not of man but of God. And he, ha he acts in the place of God upon earth with the fullest power of binding and loosing his sheep. This is a Roman Catholic encyclopedia that is saying this. This is no Protestant publication. Pope Nicholas I who ruled as Pope from 858 to 867 A.D., once said this. He wanted, uh, he wanted certain individuals to go on a crusade against the enemies of the church. And this is what he said. It is evident that the popes can neither be bound nor unbound by any earthly power, nor even by that of the apostle Peter if, she, if he should return upon the earth. Since Constantine the Great has recognized that the pontiffs held the place of God upon the earth, divinity not being able to be judged by any living man. Do they claim that the Pope is divine? Do they claim that the Pope occupies the place of God? Absolutely. And then he concludes by saying, we are not accountable for them, but to ourselves. We are responsible for our actions to no one except ourselves. Pope Leo XIII, in an encyclical letter dated January 10, 1890, had this to say. But the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. Union of minds therefore requires, together with a perfect accord in the one faith, complete submission and obedience of the will, uh, of the, the will to the church and to the Roman pontiff as to God himself. He also said in, on June 20, 1894, in the, this is found in the great encyclical letters of Leo XIII, page 304, he said, We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Does this system stand guilty as charged? Yes. Absolutely. By their own witness by their own testimony. Does the papacy claim to uh, perform the works and prerogatives of God? Notice the next section of our syllabus. Does the papacy claim to have the power to forgive sins? Yes. Does the papacy claim to be able to put, place kings and remove kings? The Bible says only God does that. Does the Pope allow people to bow to him? Does the Pope allow people to call him Holy Father? Has he, been, uh, has he executed the death penalty through the state upon those who dissent? Has he claimed to change Sabbath to Sunday? Has the papacy changed God's prophetic calendar? Do they claim to be supreme judges that can be judged by no one? Do they claim to be infallible? Yes, that is operating in the place of God, no matter what you say. And so blasphemy represents something that is done by this system that claims to occupy the place of God and claims to do the prerogatives or the actions of God. Is that clear? Now we go to point number two that I want us to notice. The Bible tells us in Revelation 13 that the number 666 is the number of the beast's name. The number of the beast's name. It's a blasphemous name, and the blasphemous name has a what? Has a number, according to Revelation 13 and verse 17. The critical question at this point is this. How do we get a number from a name? 
The answer lies in the fact that in ancient times, numbers were written with the letters of the alphabet. This practice, referred to as gematria, was used in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. This means that when the letters of the beast's blasphemous name are given their respective numerical value, the total will be 666. Now, I'm going to read a paraphrase, the Living Bible, because it's an interpretation, it's not a translation, but it tells us how the translators understand this number that is being spoken of, the number of his name. The Living Bible translates Revelation 13, verse 18, Here is a puzzle that calls for careful thought to solve it. Let those who are able interpret this code, the numerical values of the letters in his name, add to 666. So the letters in his name have numerical value. The New English Bible, which is a loose, uh, a loose translation of Scripture, it's not a strict translation, but it's not a paraphrase either, says this, the number represents a man's name, and the numerical value of its letters is 666. Even the Douay Roman Catholic Bible says this in one of the footnotes, the, no, the numeral letters of his name shall make up this number. Recently, Dr. Samuel Bakyoki, uh, may he rest in peace, he did a lot of good for the church, but kind of went off the deep end towards the end of his life. He argued that Revelation 13 verse 18 requires a name rather than a title. He said, vicarious fealty day is a title, but it says the number of his name. So it requires a name, not a title. Sounds persuasive, doesn't it? <laughs> but let's look at all of the evidence. After all, he said, the text says 666 is the number of the beast's name and not the number of his title. Dr. Bakioki therefore states that the name vicarious fealty day or the title vicarious fealty day cannot fulfill the specifications of the text. This argument, however, when examined carefully, is superficial and can be disposed of quite readily by noting that in Revelation 19, verse 16, we are told that Jesus has a name written on his vesture and on his thigh. It is not a proper name. It is a title. It is the title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So the word name can also refer to what? It can refer to a title rather than a proper name. Now we're also told, this is point number three, we are also told that the number is the number of a what? Of a man. I need to specify that the word man does not have a definite or indefinite article. In fact, in Greek, there was no indefinite, indefinite article. The Greek has a definite article, but it does not have an indefinite article. So because man does not have any article, it's translated that is the, it is the number of a man. So it is important to realize that it does not have a definite article. This means that qualitatively, the beast is a system that is centered in man. In other words, it is centered in man, is the number of man. It is noteworthy that the title, horn, the, the little horn, has what? Eyes like a man. And the apostate power of 2 Thessalonians 2 is called what? The man of sin. This is a system that is centered in whom? It is centered in man. It is based on the power and prowess of man. Now, some of our scholars have recently attempted to say that the expression, the number of a man, should really be translated the number of humanity. Is it the no it's the number of the beast, folks. What does the beast represent? The papacy. So it's not the, it's not the number of humanity. It's the number of a specific system. Let's continue. But the book of Revelation does not use the word anthropos, where we get the word anthropology from, in this sense. To translate the word anthropos in this manner denotes the art of interpretation rather than that of translation. I checked several better known 
versions of the Bible, among which were the New International, the Jerusalem Bible, the New English Bible, the New American Standard Bible, the King James Version, the New King James, the New American, the Weymouth, Phillips, RSV, to ascertain how they translate the expression, it is the number of a man. Interestingly, only the Revised Standard Version, who is uh, which is a liberal, gender-inclusive translation, translates this verse as it is a human number. None of the major ver ver versions say that it is the number of humanity. No translation says that. So we have to be suspect of theologians that tell us that that is the proper translation. Is the text of Revelation 13 and verse 18 really telling us that the number 666 applies to humanity in general rather than to the beast specifically? A careful study of Revelation 13, 1 through 10, and also of Daniel 7 and 2 Thessalonians 2 reveals unmistakably that the beast represents the Roman Catholic papacy as a system not humanity in general. If the number is the number of the beast, and the beast is a symbol of the papacy, then the number cannot apply to humanity in general, but rather specifically to the papacy. Are you understanding the point? A parallel text would be 2 Thessalonians 2, where the same system is referred to as the man of sin. The word man here is not referring to a specific individual as we've seen, but rather to a succession of rulers who make man the measure of all things rather than God. Would any serious scholar say that the expression man of sin should be translated the humanity of sin? This would be absurd. Would you translate the, that the little horn had the eyes of a man and say that it had the eyes of humanity? That is a ridiculous translation. Nobody translates it that way. The simple fact is that the system represented by the little horn or the man of sin or the beast is based on the wisdom and prowess of man. It is based on human tradition while claiming to have the right to exercise the power and the prerogatives of God. In other words, it is a system that is what? Man-centered rather than God-centered, although it claims to be God-centered. In this sense, there is a grain of truth in the idea that the number six represents a system which is centered in man, while the number seven represents a system that is based on God. But it cannot represent humanity in general. It's saying that the beast is centered in man. The papacy centers everything it does on man, on human tradition, on human prowess, while claiming to exercise the power of God. Now let's go to another point that we need to take into account. We're building an argument here. The very important question that comes to the fore at this point is this. In which language should we look for the name or the title? Should the name be sought in Hebrew? Should it be sought in Greek? Should it be sought in Latin or perhaps even in English? Angel Manuel Rodriguez has advised caution at this point. He states, and I quote, that we confront the problem of determining which language to use to determine what the name is so that we can determine the number. The biblical text does not specify any particular language. Therefore, any that, uh, any that we selected would be a matter of personal opinion. But is Dr. Rodriguez's statement accurate? I believe that we can definitely know from the Bible itself which language we are supposed to use. And which language is that? There is persuasive evidence that the name and number must be found in the Latin language. You are probably wondering why the name or the title and the number should be found in Latin. The answer is actually quite simple. The beast is clearly a Roman power. And the official language of Rome was Latin. Hello? 
that, that Latin was the Roman language in the New Testament can be seen in John 19, verse 20, in the inscription on the cross, which was in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. So Latin was the language of Rome in the times of Christ. So what should the name be? In what language should the name be? And according to what numbering system? Latin, because the beast is Roman. Notice that according to Revelation 13 and verse 2, the beast received his power, his throne, and great authority from the dragon. So the papacy receives its authority from whom? From the dragon. Though the dragon primarily represents Satan, as we have seen, it also represents the kingdom through which Satan attempted to slay the man-child, and this kingdom was what? This kingdom was Rome. It is not coincidental that the Catholic Church is officially called the Roman Catholic Church. So if the beast represents the papacy, and the papacy is Rome, we must find the name in Latin, which is the language of the Roman Catholic Church. Is that the language of the Roman Catholic Church? Of course it is. Now, if the beast represents the Roman Catholic papacy, then we should look for his name in Latin, the official language of ancient Rome and papal Rome. And if the name is in Latin, then we should use what kind of numerals? We should use Roman numerals to ascertain the number of his name. In short, both the name and the respective numerical equivalents of its letters must be sought in the Latin language. So far so good? So let's summarize what the Bible has to say about this. First, it must be what kind of name? A blasphemous name. That is to say, it must apply to a system that claims to represent God on earth and that claims to have the power to forgive sins among other actions and prerogatives. Second, the name must be in what? In Latin, the language of Rome. Third, the numerical equivalents of, uh, equivalents of the letters of the name must be found in what? In Roman numerals, because you're dealing with Rome. And fourth, the number must be that of man. It will be noticed that the title Vicarious Philly Day fits all of these criteria. But two critically important questions remain to be answered. But before we do, allow me to digress just for a moment. It is noteworthy, and this is something that is not recognized very frequently, but it is noteworthy that the Latin poets who originally devised the system of Roman numerals, broke with the tradition of the day, and instead of using all of the letters to be equivalent of, as numbers, as in Greek, all of the letters have numerical value, and also in Hebrew, all of the letters have numerical value, what the Latin poets did was they chose six letters to represent all numbers. We know them as the Roman numerals. Those letters are... 1, or I, V, X, L, C, and you say D. How many do we have there? Six. And you say, what about the M? The fact is that M was not part of the original numerical system. It was added later. But in the original system, the Latin poets established a system of numbering that was composed of only six Roman numerals. Do you know how they wrote a thousand before the, the M was established? I can show you pictures of it. They would put a D like this and another D like this next to that one. Two Ds side by side. That's the way that they wrote a thousand. So, why six Roman numerals? If you add the Roman numerals, one plus five plus ten plus fifty plus a hundred plus five hundred the total of the Roman numerals is 666. This indicates that the number 666 is somehow related to Rome because they chose six letters and the six letters add up to the number 666. Now here's another question that we need to ask. Is Vicarious Philly Day an official title of the succession of popes? And a second question is, 
is this, was this ever inscribed on the papal tiara or triple crown or on his mitre? That's a very important question. Was this title an official title of the papacy and was it ever on the tiara or was it ever on the mitre of the pope? We have to wrestle with these two questions. And we're not going to be able to finish all of this tonight, but uh, we'll get so as far as we can within our time constraints. The historical evidence indicates that the answer to the first question is yes. It is an official title of a succession of popes. Some, such as Roman Catholic apologist Patrick Madrid, he's one of the strong uh, individuals who defends the Roman Catholic Church and its theology, he claimed that the name Vicarious Philidae has never been used as a title for the Pope. Although I must say that later on he revised his statement and he said it was never used as an official title of, for the Popes. Madrid said, Vicarious Philidae, or Vicar of the Son of God, is not now, nor has it ever been, a title of the Bishop of Rome. That's found in Envoy magazine, March, April, 1998. However, an examination of the historical, uh, the historical evidence indicates clearly that Madrid is making an inaccurate statement. Let's talk, first of all, about the donation of Constantine. Have you ever talked to, uh, heard about the donation of Constantine? You know, the donation of Constantine was uh, a forgery that was prepared to sustain the claims of the popes. Let's, let's follow this in the next paragraphs. The donation of Constantine, which basically said that Constantine donated all these lands and all this power to the pope, but it was never written by Constantine. It was actually a forgery written by the priests of the Roman Catholic Church and by popes. Ten popes, at least, ten popes in a succession used the donation of Constantine to... Uh, to sustain their claims to temporal power. Now I want you to notice what the donation of Constantine had to say. And this is the portion of the, of the uh, donation that deals with the subject that we're studying. As the blessed Peter is seen to have been constituted, what? Vicar of the Son of God. And by the way, in La this is in Latin. And in Latin it says vicarius, fili, dei. So as the blessed Peter is seen to have been constituted vicar of the Son of God on the earth, so the pontiffs, who are the representatives of that same chief of the apostles, should obtain from us and our empire the power of a supremacy greater than the clemency of our earthly imperial serenity is seen to have conceded to it. So basically we're supposed to concede temporal power to the papacy is what he's saying, because the Pope is what? The vicar of the Son of God. Now the donation was purportedly a letter written by Constantine the Great to Pope Sylvester I. In the letter, Constantine supposedly gave temporal power to the Pope. We know for certain that the donation was in existence in the ninth century, but was used beginning in the 11th century to justify the outrageous temporal claims of the papacy. They would always say, Constantine said, <laughs> you know, whenever they, the, the question was asked, do you have a right to this territory? Do you have a right to this temporal power? Constantine said. They always used the donation of Constantine. Now, the authenticity of the donation of Constantine was first questioned in the 15th century with the advent of historical criticism. Nicholas of Cusa, had serious reservations about the authenticity of the donation. And around 1450 AD, this is long after it started to be used by the papacy, uh, Nicholas of Cusa had ser excuse me, Gregory, no, Laurentius Valla, had serious questions about this donation, and he proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was a forgery and a fraud. Notably, the Vatican did not appreciate Vaya's work, and so they put his book on the index of forbidden books in 1559. That is, the Office of the Inquisition did that. Now, Roman Catholic apologist 
Patrick Madrid, has brushed aside this evidence by stating the obvious, that the donation of Constantine was a forgery. Madrid therefore concludes that, it, concludes that it cannot be used as an official and authorized statement of the Roman Catholic Church. Sounds plausible. Although it is true that the donation was a forgery, it is also beyond dispute that the donation was panned off as authentic and official by various popes of the Roman Catholic Church, by theologians, and for hundreds of years to sustain the temporal power of the papacy. Though it was a forgery, it was used as an official document by these popes to sustain their claims to temporal power. If they used it knowing full well that it was a forgery, then they were guilty of deception. On the other hand, if they did not know that the donation was a forgery, what does this say about their infallibility? It is significant, this is important, it is significant that Gratian's Decretals, published in 1140 AD, and this is deemed official by the Roman Catholic Church. The papal title from the donation comes into Roman Catholic canon law with the following words, Beatrus, Beatus Petrus in Terris, Vicarius Filidei esse videtur constitutus. So is, is uh, the title being used in an official publication of the Roman Catholic Church? Absolutely. Now, let's notice what Cardinal Manning had to say. This is talking about the 1800s now. He wrote a book titled The Temporal Power of the Vicar of Jesus Christ. It was published in 1862 and I've read this in previous sessions. Basically, uh, this uh, book is an indictment against the nations of Europe for abandoning the papacy after the papacy received its deadly wound. Now notice what uh, this cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church wrote in this year. See this Catholic Church, this Church of God, feeble and weak, Rejected even by the very nations called Catholic. There is Catholic France and Catholic Germany and Catholic Italy giving up this exploded figment of the temporal power of the vicar of Jesus Christ. And now notice. And so, because the church seems weak and the what? And the vicar of the Son of God is renewing the passion of his master upon the earth Therefore, we are scandalized. Therefore, we turn our faces from him. Did Manning say that Vicar of the Son of God is an official title of the papacy? Absolutely. Now, after mentioning the growing temporal power of the papacy under popes of the past, such as Gregory I, Leo III, Gregory VII, and Alexander III, Manning elevates the idea of the temporal power of the pope. He calls it a dogma a law of conscience, an axiom of the reason, and a theological certainty. And then he states this also in his book on page 231. So that I may say there never was a time when the temporal power of the vicar of the Son of God, there it is again, though assailed as we see it, was more firmly rooted throughout the whole unity of the Catholic Church and convictions of its members. Did Cardinal Manning use the name Vicar of the Son of God to refer to the Pope? Absolutely. Manning explained why the European nations enjoyed stability in the past as compared with the disarray in Europe in the times when he wrote. And once again, he says on page 232, it was a dignified obedience to bow to the Vicar of the Son of God and to remit the arbitration of their griefs to one whom all wills consented to obey. Is there evidence that the name Vicar of the Son of God is an official title of the Roman Catholic Church and the popes? Absolutely. It is in the donation of Constantine, used by a succession of ten popes. It is in the decretals, uh, uh, published in 1140. It is found in the writings of Edward Manning. And I want you to notice additional evidence. Lucius Ferraris, the encyclopedia that I mentioned to you before, in his encyclopedia, Plumped Up Bibliotheca, 
1890 edition, volume 6, page 43, column 2, has the title very clearly revealed that the Pope is to be called Vicarious Philly Day. Now let's notice also what Pope John Paul II had to say in his book Crossing the Threshold of Hope about the Pope. This is how he expressed it. The leader of the Catholic Church is defined by the faith as what? As the vicar of Jesus Christ and is accepted as such by believers. The Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God. That's vicarious for the day, folks who takes the place or represents the Son of God, and then he explains what that means. Who takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. So John Paul II is saying that that title is applied to the popes. Notice that Pope John Paul II not only affirmed that the Pope is the vicar of Jesus Christ who represents the Son of God, but he also explained what he meant by the word represents when he said that he takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. The expression takes the place is the exact English equivalent to the Latin word vicarious. Even Dr. Bacchiocchi had to admit that vicarious Philly Day was an official title of a succession of Roman Catholic popes. Uh, and this is what he wrote in uh, one of his end time issues. Madrid's denial is absolutely false. Madrid, the apologist who said that uh, this is not an official title, he says this is absolutely false. We noted earlier that the papal claim to be vicarious Philly Day is found in major Catholic historical documents and is acknowledged, this is an important thing, and is acknowledged even by Professor Johannes Quasten, the leading Catholic patrologist in the world. The reference that Dr. Bacchiocchi makes to Professor Johannes Quasten is very interesting. There is a notarized affidavit in the General Conference archives, and I have a copy of that in my files, signed by Conrad Sturr and Robert Correa, where Dr. Quasten, in his own handwriting, wrote the title Vicarious Christi, as well as the title Vicarious Philly Day, is very common as the title of the Pope. So this is an official title of the Roman Catholic Papacy. Now we have things that we still have to take a look at. We're going to look at some additional Catholic evidence where the, whether the inscription was on the tiara or the triple crown in our next study together. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary-level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.